Forbidden Sanctum is a league that diverged in mechanics quite drastically from previous Path of Exile leagues. The Sanctum functions as a roguelite, giving players a new life pool, resolve, and overruling all normal mitigation tactics besides get good manual dodging. This means even hardcore players can, and will, die within the Sanctum until they get enough relics and good boons to outweigh their face-tanking reflexes and afflictions to get through all four floors. It's like Hades minus the hot gods, and in my humble opinion, an extremely welcome and satisfying mechanic. But beyond, yes, pun intended, the great mechanics, Forbidden Sanctum is also absolutely brimming with lore. Its story connects to lore that has existed since the beginning of Path of Exile, more recent additions like Scourge, absolutely dunks on the Templar propaganda of Innocence's Ascension story, and in my opinion, strengthens a theory I've been brewing about a new foundation of core lore for Path of Exile. This will be a long video as there is enough information here to create at least two, if not three, lore videos. So hold on to your bones as we descend into the winding crypt of lore that Forbidden Sanctum contains. The League begins with us meeting an NPC named Divinia in the forest encampment of Act 2. Divinia is a Templar academic and relic enthusiast, presumably traveling here from Oriath to uncover an abandoned Templar enclave beneath the ruins of Felshrine. Her use of the term enclave is important, because an enclave is a small group or place within a larger area that is culturally distinct from its surroundings. At first, I suspected that Archbishop Joffrey, the last Templar in the Frisia Cathedral before the Cataclysm, which is now the Felshrine Ruins, was related in some way to this forbidden sanctum. But Joffrey didn't seem the type to be chill about Templars doing secret demon worship next door, considering his condemnation of Malagaro's laboratory, giving it the moniker Chamber of Sins, and the Frisia Cathedral existed before Joffrey's presence in it. We can surmise a couple of things about the Sanctum immediately. The Sanctum's activities were happening separately, but next to the Templar activities in the Frisia Cathedral, and they must have been happening before Joffrey, because he would not have allowed it. Likely, the Sanctum was abandoned before Joffrey was around. I won't get too ahead of myself, but I believe that the Sanctum existed years, if not hundreds of years, before the Purity Rebellion took place in 1334 IC. Davinia studied archaeology and recognizes Helena in the encampment as they had both pursued similar fields of research. Helena came to Rayclast alongside Dominus's blackguards to study artifacts, although she deserted once she learned of the High Templar's dark ambitions to create a new empire in his own image with thaumaturgy. Unlike Helena, Davinia's loyalty to the Templars remains intact. Divinia follows us as we search the Felshrine ruins and go not to the Frisia Cathedral in the crypt, seriously that took me a while to figure out, but to a small underground entrance of the Forbidden Sanctum. Inside the Sanctum, Divinia hands us a relic to arrange on the Chantry, which is defined as an area, in this case an altar, blessed by a priest or holy person to celebrate a religious person's death. Mechanically, we put relics into the altar to boost our chances of completing the Sanctum. When we put our first relic in the altar, Divinia claims we're glowing and we must be drawing on something sacred, implying we are receiving a blessing for our offering to whichever god holds power here. But as we enter the Sanctum, it becomes quite clear that this place is anything but holy. There are four floors we must traverse, and as we descend, the Sanctum goes from being a relatively clean and organized library to a dark and frightening crypt with bones strewn about. And while each floor has guards and a boss at the end, the guards and monsters change from things you'd see in the reliquary of Oriath to unmistakably scourge demons. The rooms on each floor have one of four objectives. Run, fight and run, fight in a circle, or fight a mini-boss. And you can be rewarded or punished in various ways with the system of afflictions and boons, both major and minor, or treasure throughout, offered by chests, fountains, or even Divinia herself selling you stuff she's, I guess, just 
collected on her way down. As you progress, it's hard not to just focus on the gameplay, as suddenly we are having to dodge and zip about rather than face tank our enemies. But even the most unobservant exile could pick up on the obvious change in decor, vibe, and enemy as you progress. It begs the question, why is Divinia interested in this place? And how has it never come up before when it's located among the ruins of such a historical site? As I mentioned, I don't think that the Forbidden Sanctum was created or observably occupied during the Purity Rebellion or the Cataclysm almost 300 years ago. The Sanctum being a crypt actually does match the Felshrine ruins as we know them. The ruins of the actual Frisia Cathedral above are destroyed, but we can go underground to its crypt. I suspect that the Sanctum itself was seen as an abandoned crypt by the time Archbishop Joffrey was heading the Frisia Cathedral. According to Divinia, a lot can be inferred about the ancient Templars from their burial practices, their scripture, their artifacts. First, the distinction of ancient Templars in regards to the Sanctum, juxtaposed with calling the Felshrine ruins an important part of Rayclastian history, is part of why I think the Sanctum predates Joffrey. Secondly, the burial practices we can see in this crypt are a key instigating factor in the life and transformation of Lycia, the final boss of the Sanctum. Before I discuss Lycia as a person, let's finish setting the scene for the time and place of the Sanctum's creation. I believe that this Sanctum had to have been built sometime after the Eternal Empire was founded, based on the architecture and the use of the Sanctum as a library slash catacombs, a combination that feels particularly eternal. We know from Divinia that Lycia has endured centuries of isolation within the Sanctum. Centuries could still put Lycia's mortal existence at the time of the Purity Rebellion, or even more recently, although I doubt Templars were coming to Rayclast often just after the Cataclysm of 1336. While I can only narrow her time from 1 to 1336 solidly, she had access to knowledge passed down by the High Templars of the impending threat of the Scourge, which makes me assume she was alive sometime between 1000 and 1300. That window of time is admittedly just a vibe. As we will learn, there's no way to know for sure how long the Templars have had knowledge of the Scourge, or how long the Scourge have been a threat to Rayclast. We find out this league that the Templar religion was actually founded within the Asmiri tribes, while they still lived on the Asmirian mountain ranges. I'll explore this absolute bombshell of a revelation later, as it's one of the subjects that could be its own full video. But how that relates to the Sanctum is that we now know for sure that the Templars could have joined Tarkas Veruso as he descended from the mountains onto the ruins of the Vol and founded Sarn and that the Templar presence actually expanded to Oriath from Rayclast and not the other way around. A line in the Ancients Library text, The Light of Frisia, reinforces that Templars were among the Eternals as early as 35 IC. Trinian writes, To care for this empire with eyes open, a traditional vow made by the High Templar upon the coronation of an Eternal Emperor. I had assumed Templars came from Oriath, so this was an older but not ancient connection between Templars and Eternals to describe the vision of Eternal Emperors, people like Vol, who spurned Thaumaturgy. I now believe that the first Frisian Eternal Emperor, Alana Frisia, was sworn in by a High Templar quite literally. While the Templars did not become a ruling theocracy until the Purity Rebellion, they had an influence and presence in the Felshrine Ruins area, likely creating the Frisia Cathedral themselves for Templar purposes, and therefore the nearby Sanctum was initially created as an ossuary to hold the bones of many deceased Templars. The burial practices of the Templars is what pushed Lycia over the edge, and part of what inspired her to make a pact with the Scourge Demon. She writes, When I was young, I never questioned our faith. We pile the bones of former Templars in massive ossuaries that fill the spaces under the earth. Each one is hollowed, we are told. Yet as I stood there on that broken day, 
Gazing at the bones I was supposed to join, I realized I had no idea who any of these people were. But I will be remembered. Lycia, a Templar of unknown occupation, had discovered the terrible lie of the origins of innocence. With this earth-shattering revelation ringing in her mind, she went to this Templar ossuary, where she had been told the bones of every person were remembered and kept sacred, and found piles of unnamed bones scattered about. Another Templar lie. I learned a forbidden Templar secret. There are no records of the deceased. They are not hallowed forever together like the priests told us as children. They are simply discarded, thrust away into crypts, and buried haphazardly in the earth. Lycia decided the Templar's lies would not stand. She would not be forgotten and thrown into the bone pile. She used her knowledge of other forbidden Templar secrets to call upon the scourge demon Baydat and make a deal for her immortality so that she would never be forgotten among the bones. Perhaps ironically, she made this deal within the very place these unmarked bones were kept by the Templars. When Lycia made her pact with Baydat, she became immortal, but also trapped inside the sanctum, constantly funneling adventurers and treasure hunters into it as sacrifice by placing tempting portals around Rayclast. Now, when we face her on the fourth floor, she appears to us first as Lycia, unholy heretic, a rather normal-looking humanoid, and then finally as a demon, Lycia, herald of the scourge, with wings that remind me of the pale angels. She takes us through a portal simply labeled Beyond. Both Lycia and Divinia had knowledge through the Templars about the Scourge, which is knowledge only available to the line of High Templars and their keepers of the Forbidden. Since neither are High Templars, this means that both women were keepers of the Forbidden, if they had access to this information. This position is probably also how Lycia discovered the true origins of innocence, which makes me wonder how many other people are aware of these Templar secrets. While Davinia plays coy about her purpose for coming to the Forbidden Sanctum, her in-depth knowledge of Lycia is pretty suspicious. So it's strange that when we meet Davinia, she acts like a curious little bookworm just wanting to gather artifacts and relics. She is certainly more informed about Lycia and the Sanctum than she initially lets on. Davinia basically trickle-truths us as we explore the Sanctum, going from simply studying Templar history to asking us about the woman's voice as if she doesn't know who it could be, to musing about if the creatures in the Sanctum are guarding something before finally revealing how much she actually knows. She was aware of who Lycia was, although she wasn't sure if she had physical form or if she was some kind of spirit or entity. She knew Lycia had made a deal with Baydat while researching her occult activities, that Lycia chose an unholy path out of spite, knowing the Templar preachings to be riddled with fallacies, and that scourge demons are all around us eternally trying to enter our world and we cannot let them manifest themselves more than temporarily or they will consume every living thing. There's good reason to believe she knew exactly what we'd find in the Forbidden Sanctum. But why? We can only hope that Divinia's motives are to stop the Scourge and not something more sinister. Speaking of the Scourge, the demon Baydat is actually one of the three Scourge bosses we have already encountered on Rayclast since Scourge League came out. In fact, you can still fight him just out and about in maps. He is the leader of the Pale Demons, one of the three factions we encounter. According to Divinia, Baydat and the Pale Demons can think, speak, and communicate like and with humans. The other two factions, the Demon Faction led by Katash the Hate Shepherd, and the Flesh Faction led by Gore the Grasping Maw, are seemingly unable, or at least unwilling, to communicate. As Davinia says, they are far too unlike us to ever be capable of making a deal with someone like Lycia. Although the Scourge are separated into factions, they all desire to consume. We were warned by the last to die that the Scourge had already invaded and destroyed an alternate dimension of Rayclast, 
where Last to Die had been fighting them for most of her life, before using her dimension-traveling powers to come warn our version of Rayclast of their presence, and giving us her Blood Crucible, a device passed down since the time of the Vol between members of a bloodline, to continue this battle here. She never makes it seem that the Scourge invasion is terribly imminent on our version of Rayclast, just that she is too weak to carry on her own multidimensional fight against them. The Last to Die tells us the only world she has traveled to that survived a full assault by the Scourge was one dominated by the shade of High Templar Venarius. We know from Niles in Heist and Venarius' own dialogue in Synthesis that he was very aware of the looming threat of demons from beyond the Veil. In fact, Venarius was attempting to treat with the Shade of the Elder and its dreamlands for power, but Venarius claims that power was for Rayclast to protect it properly. Putting these pieces together, I believe that this version of Venarius, whose Rayclast survived, was able to wield the power of the Elder, or another Eldritch being, to fight the Scourge. Perhaps that is why the last to die pegs us as being capable enough to take on her Blood Crucible. We are no stranger to eldritch entities and powers. To our understanding, Venarius was the only High Templar to try and actively fight the threat of demons from other dimensions. But with so many people having access to the knowledge of this threat, the Templars who can access the Forbidden Texts, the last to die in whatever dimensions she has visited, all the way back to the Templars of Lycia's time. Why does Davinia have an interest in the Sanctum now? If Lycia has been trapped for an eternity, are she and Baydat really a threat? Davinia has knowledge of the Scourge not only from forbidden texts of the Templars, but also from a note she found from a madwoman who mysteriously disappeared from a Templar jail cell a few years ago. Keep the timeline, a few years ago, in mind as Davinia recalls the note. She said the name Katash, and she ranted about the demons not thinking, because many don't have heads, and that something else does the thinking for them. And that is almost word for word what Last to Die tells us in Scourge League. She says about the demon faction led by Katash, What part of them thinks? Some don't have heads. What if they don't think at all? What if something else does the thinking and they're just drones? So now, on top of all this sanctum lore, we've got a wild time and dimension mystery to solve here. There is no question that Last to Die is the one who was in a Templar jail cell a few years ago. She wrote that note. But the last to die that we meet is from another dimension of Rayclast and only comes to us to pass on her blood crucible before she dies. There are a few possibilities of what happened here. I'll go over them from least to most likely. One, our Alva was in the jail cell and has known about the impending threat of the Scourge, even writing notes about it while in jail for the Templars. We have to assume, if we believe that Alva is the last to die, that she also has had the Blood Crucible just tucked away somewhere with or without knowledge of its purpose. Since the Blood Crucible was passed down exclusively through their bloodline until it's given to us, either Alva has received it and just never brings it up, she's received it and doesn't know what it's for, or she has not received it and also doesn't know what it's for. But to be able to mysteriously escape Templar Jail, Alva would need access to dimension or time travel, and her methods of time travel are pretty restricted to Vol waypoints, unlike the portable Blood Crucible. Alva did get in some trouble with the Templars, saying that damned High Templar knew she was keeping something secret, and she was no longer welcome amongst the nobility, so it's not impossible she was also jailed. And this is after she learned the Vol Blood Thaumaturgy needed to visit the Temple of Atsawatl. Still, I really think this revelation puts a huge dent in the Alva is the last to die theory, and perhaps the asset and voice actress reuse were really just coincidences. 2. Our Dimension's last to die is the one who was in the Templar jail cell and is still out there. Whoever was in the jail cell had to have a method of escaping mysteriously. 
This person in jail had knowledge of the scourge and means to escape, which means most likely they possessed and used the blood crucible. While I like the idea of having our own last to die, it's most likely this. Three, the last to die visited our timeline a few years ago to warn our Templars about the threat of the Scourge. Since she had been fighting the Scourge in her own dimension most of her life and had traveled to many other dimensions to see the states of Scourge in each, she would have reason to warn people about the threat of the Scourge. Especially since she tells us that through countless shifts, she saw only one Ray class survive, a world dominated by the shade of High Templar Venarius. It would make sense she wanted to warn the Templars specifically, even in a world without Venarius. We can assume Last to Die is aware that High Templars know about the Scourge through her travels. We also don't know how long this madwoman was stuck in a jail cell, so she honestly could have popped by just long enough to try to warn them, get jailed, write a note, and go home. In whatever form, there is no question that the last to die is who left the note that Davinia found. And even in the face of this note, and backed by the forbidden texts, the Templars simply jailed someone trying to bring light to this threat, rather than take action. We know that the Templars have known about the Scourge since Lycia's time and likely before, predating the Purity Rebellion of 1334, if not way longer. That means for hundreds if not thousands of years, the Templars have known about interdimensional threats. In addition, the last to die has had the Blood Crucible passed down her bloodline from a time when the High Priests of the Vol worshipped Chaos and made a pact with him to receive this Crucible. Chaos does seem capable of seeing possibilities far into the future, hence his love of gambles and wagers and his disdain for Atziri, who is apparently an island of stability, whose history of existence is a single unbroken course where no world, real or imagined, did not have the Vol led to ruin by Atziri. Chaos is the essence of all that might be, and he is fascinated by skilled mortals who can bend chance in their own favor. Chaos must have seen the threat of the Scourge as well, however far into the future it was from when he made a pact with the High Priests of the Vol. We don't know for sure that the Blood Crucible's only purpose is to combat the Scourge, but we aren't given any other uses for it. That means that the Scourge have been a force threatening Rayclast since before the fall of the Vol, 400 BIC. How long have the Templars known about the Scourge? And how did they get this knowledge? Could it be that the Vol and Templars had some level of camaraderie and exchanged this information? I don't think so. At least we don't have evidence for this. The modern Templars have long been interested in studying Vol artifacts and magics, and have clearly compiled a large compendium of knowledge. So I believe this is something the Templars learned from writings of the Vol who were given the Blood Crucible. But still, the Scourge have been known since before the fall of the Vol, to some extent, whether or not they were even yet a force at play for our Rayclast. It makes you wonder how many other secrets of the world and the surrounding dimensions the Templars know of, and how they have used this information. One secret that was revealed to us through unique relics of the Sanctum certainly demonstrates the lengths the Templars will go to cover up and repackage information for their own benefit. And that, of course, is the knowledge that set Lycia over the edge, the true origins of innocence. Diligent lore enjoyers will know that I have always held issue with the Templar story of Sin and Innocence's ascension presented to us on the stained glass windows in Oriath. I have derided it for being clear Templar propaganda, because the story itself doesn't make sense. It's a transparent moral allegory for righteousness and purity, but being burned at the stake never made sense as Sin's ascension, and just being a really good boy didn't actually explain Innocence's ascension either. Now I get to check Innocence's origin story as propaganda off my list of things I was right about. The actual story as we hear it from Lycia on the Unique Relics is much more interesting. 
We learn that Sin and Innocence are brothers who once lived among the Asmiri, while the Asmiri still inhabited the Asmirian mountain ranges. Innocence was aware of gods, likely Solaris, Lunaris, and Viridi, as those seem to be the oldest gods we know of and were also worshipped by the Asmiri, and he desperately wanted to become a god himself. He was even aware of the methods by which godhood was achieved, namely getting enough people to admire, follow, or fear you to accumulate enough energy to spark divinity. And Innocence's methods so far had been to try to found a religion. But not enough people followed his initial symbols and proverbs for him to achieve godhood, until one day something happened, something that was foreshadowed in Siege of the Atlas expansion. The Cleansing Fire and possibly the Searing Exarch visited the lands of Rayclast. With the Cleansing Fire came the Newcomers. Now, the origins of these Newcomers are unclear. They could be people who somehow came with the Cleansing Fire and escaped its presence by hiding, or a group of people already on Rayclast who were visited by the Cleansing Fire. They were, for sure, people new to the Asmerian Ranges, having traveled to escape. I have a hard time buying that aliens came with the cleansing fire and then stayed here, but there really isn't enough information. I've tried to come up with a satisfying explanation of the newcomers, at least who they were originally, but there's a point when you have to move on. We do know from the crystallized omniscience that the newcomers came out as scorched refugees from a shrine, speaking in tongues and praying to a new symbol of power out of fear. This amulet first appeared in Siege, but what we didn't know until now with Forbidden Sanctum is that these refugees were on Rayclast, and that Innocence found them. Seeing these people afraid, with a symbol they revered that represented a terrific power, Innocence saw the perfect opportunity to start his religion and become a god. We've seen how important symbols are to the Templar religion, the Templar Descry, a bastardization of the Cleansing Fire's symbol, is plastered all over wherever the Templars reside. Like a banner of war, a symbol must represent one's belief and purpose, and in Innocence's case, this new symbol already embodied the flames of Eldritch Fire, and the toothless promise of saving people from that fire. The newcomers were terrified of fire, he used their fear to control them. He claimed only his god could protect them. And who is this god? Well, at the time it was the Cleansing Fire, or as Innocence dubbed it, the Lord of Light. But now that god is Innocence himself. The biggest bombshell in this revelation is that Maxarius, the first High Templar, the one who was apparently gifted the sign of purity in the shape of the Descry by Innocence himself to start the Templar religion, Maxarius is actually Innocence. So Innocence, Maxarius, takes the symbol of the cleansing fire, the newcomer's fear, and a promise of protection, and begins spreading the word of his new religion. On Dawnbreaker, he is quoted as saying, why should we fear the fire when we serve the Lord of Light? Only those who were sinners would be burned by the Lord of Light. Those who were righteous and pure need not fear the fire. There is nothing to fear if you follow me, but if you are a sinner, you will be burned. As we've seen in many Ascension stories, fear is the most potent tool to gain enough attention to become a god. To solidify his plans, Innocence deemed his own brother, whose original name we do not know, as the pinnacle of this sin. Like many religions, he needed to establish an us versus them. Maxarius vilified his brother, sparking zealotry, and the change finally began. They ascended together, one, sin, unwillingly. Sin became black as coal his ashen body representing the consequences of the fire that would burn any who were impure. And Maxarius, now Innocence, became golden. The Asmerians around them who did not follow this new religion 
found Maxarius's hollow gilding of Asmerian traditions distasteful. The Asmerians valued purity, but in an ascetic sense, one that shunned materialism, not one of moral self-righteousness. They forced Innocence and his new followers off the mountain range. Lycia notes all of this with clear disdain. It's all here, the lie at the core of my faith. Maxarius was not chosen by Innocence, he was Innocence, a charlatan, a liar, and a power seeker. He sacrificed his own brother for the selfish purpose of attaining godhood, something he could not earn on his own merit. He had to steal the symbol of the cleansing fire, utilize the fear of the newcomers and any who knew of the fires from this god, this lord of light, and use his brother as an effigy for everything his new religion was against, with absolutely no merit behind this vilification. The fact that after we defeat Kitava, Sin is able to forgive Innocence and ask for his help in restoring Oriath is mind-blowing with this revelation. Sin was turned into a god by the sheer amount of hatred Innocence had created around him, pinned a symbol of everything wrong, and yet he does not hate Innocence. But Innocence could not let his new religious followers know this. So he created the relationship of Maxarius and Innocence, replacing the Lord of Light with himself, but using the same iconography. The death cry, the purifying flames, the ashes of sin. He likely made up the story of the mother of two, outlining how sin was bad, as a fable for his followers to exemplify for their own behavior. Burn the impure, don't be like sin. And that's probably why the original story, the story likely propagated by Innocence himself, of their ascension always rang so hollow. Just like the Asmerians felt about Innocence's new religious traditions. He was, and has always been, shallow, greedy, puritanical, and self-righteous. The purpose of that story, and everything the Templars stand for, is to keep people in line within the religion to create the fear of being burned, even if that threat has changed from the cleansing fire to innocence. But the true origins of innocence is something the Templars kept and had in writing, and multiple people must have known about within the religion. These Templars did not care about the truth of their god or their religion. They only cared about keeping power and moral authority over others. And this is why, to Lycia, they all must die. Their hypocrisy knows no bounds, and the scourge will consume this world of sinners. So now we understand a bit more about Lycia's motivations for creating a pact with Baydat. She was disillusioned with the multiple lies she discovered, that Innocence was actually Maxarius and a desperate grifter, and that the Templars did not venerate and remember their dead, but instead discarded their bones unlabeled in piles. And she used her access to the forbidden texts to contact Baydat and achieve immortality, with the aim of wiping out the Templars at the expense of her eternal isolation and the world's population, but with the gift of actually being remembered and having power. As Davinia put it, Lycia renounced the path of righteousness, and now Lycia remains in the forbidden sanctum luring people in to gain power for some ritual that is almost complete. That ritual is probably to allow Baydat and the Scourge to fully enter Rayclast, as Lycia has already received immortality, and the threat of the Scourge has not yet truly descended on us, although it is burgeoning. Apparently, the Blood Moon rises and Baydat beckons just beyond the door. But as with many Path of Exile leagues, once we face Lycia, we are destined to repeat the cycle of approaching and defeating her, with her plans never fully coming to fruition under our repetitive victories over her. As Davinia says, she is truly immortal, so all we can do is delay her, but every time she is slain, you buy us time to work on a more permanent solution. Unlike some recent leagues, we have been given an absolutely massive amount of in-game lore to contend with. I've laid out what we know so far that is actually present in-game, but I think a recap is in order, 
because I, of course, have some more theories and questions. So, Lycia was a Templar who lived sometime between the Purity Rebellion in 1334 IC and likely sometime after the founding of the Eternal Empire in 1 IC. She was a scholar and had access to the forbidden texts of the Templars, which revealed the truth of Innocence's origins and the burial practices of the Templars, sending Lycia over the edge. She vowed to take revenge on the Templars, to be remembered, and made a deal with the scourge demon Bedat, one of the pale demons who are actually willing and able to bargain with humans for their own ends. In exchange for eternity, she gave Bedat and the demons a foothold in Rayclast with the possibility to garner more power. In modern times, Divinia, also a Templar and a keeper of the forbidden knowledge, seeks out the Sanctum, but needs someone battle-hardened to be the muscle behind this operation of exploring this abandoned place of ancient Templar history. She slowly reveals to us how much she knows about Lycia and the Scourge within this place, although it takes her quite some time to be forthright. She eventually tells us that she had researched Lycia's occult activities before coming to the Sanctum, in addition to having read a note left by some version of the last to die about scourge demons that was left in a Templar jail cell years ago. While she does seem to want to stop Lycia and the scourge, she seems completely unfazed by the scourge themselves, the knowledge of innocence that so deeply angered Lycia, and Lycia's immortal presence within the Forbidden Sanctum. Her most emotional reaction is to say that what happened to Lycia is sad. She chose an unholy path out of spite, knowing the Templar preachings to be riddled with fallacies. Divinia's awareness of needing muscle to explore a supposedly abandoned structure and her utter ambivalence to shocking revelations about Lycia, the Templars, and innocence make her true motivations for coming to the Sanctum questionable. She could either be here to stop Lycia and the Scourge, or to learn how Lycia became immortal and whether bargaining with the Scourge was worth the reward. So with that recap, let's move on to questions. One of the questions that we touched on earlier is, how long have the Templars known about the Scourge? And how long has the Scourge been a threat to Rayclast? Before this league, I had presumed that High Templar Venerius's particular interest in the demons beyond was something unique to him. While the Atlas and the Elder had predated Venerius's reign, it didn't seem that Venerius knew what the Elder was when he encountered its shade in the Dreamlands. And so I thought perhaps the knowledge of the Templars about the more cosmic and dimensional was limited and Venerius just had a special interest or was privy to some new information about demons beyond the veil. Now, knowing how many secrets the Templars have, and that the knowledge of Scourge must be at least centuries old, it puts Venerius in a new light. From what we've been told, he's the only High Templar to have taken proactive action on this knowledge. It haunted him, according to Niles. I don't think Venerius knew that the Shade was the Elder, but he may have had a better idea of what he was bargaining with, at least that the Shade was not a mere king, but some powerful entity. The Order of the Jinn, a Mariketh tribe who took in orphans from all peoples of Rayclast, had members that worked together to originally seal the Elder away. They created Starforge, a blade to separate spirit from body, with the help of an Asmiri, a Mutewind, and an Eternal member. The Order certainly knew of the Elder, and one member at some time was a Templar, as seen on the Legion Scarabs. The rusted Legion Scarabs suggest the Order and Templars wanted to start a new era of cooperation. Knowledge of the Elder, in whatever form it existed at the time of their cooperation, could have been shared. Perhaps the Templars, knowing the truth of Maxarius and possibly given knowledge from the Order, were even aware of other eldritch entities like the Cleansing Fire. Maybe they hadn't put those pieces together. They may have just assumed Maxarius stole the symbol from the newcomers, who were afraid of some god's fire rather than an eldritch entity. But still, the knowledge and length of knowledge of the cosmic threats by the Templars 
is something to ponder. Speaking of the newcomers, I am thoroughly uncertain who they were. My first thought when Crystallized Omniscience was released during Siege of the Atlas was that this story was possibly about the Kalgur who had fled the Empty-Eyed Fiend and the Risen Ulroth, and hid in the ancient site of power where Uhtred had disappeared. Inside was a giant mirror which could have been a portal, potentially to the cosmos. This ancient site of power could have been the shrine that is described on crystallized omniscience, and the fire they feared could have been the Triskelion flame they had so relied upon, how it abandoned them, went from purifying their food and protecting them from Rayclast, to leaving them vulnerable and forcing their leaders to use virtue gems and turn into vicious monsters. The last entry in Expedition even says, there is still one way out, one we dare not risk before, hidden under the earth and older than the oldest men. This is not the end of our people. Night falls, but there will be dawn. And the Kalgur would have certainly been seen as newcomers to anyone on Rayclast. But of course, the timing for that event and the Ascension of Innocence is completely off. The Kalgur visited after the fall of the Vol and by that time Sin had already ascended and created the beast. And these newcomers were specifically fleeing the cleansing fire, as the Templar Descry, Innocence, or Maxarius, copied from the newcomers, is unmistakably inspired by the symbol seen on the Searing Exarch, one of the cleansing fire's mortal champions. But could these newcomers truly be from another planet, being chased by the cleansing fire? We don't even know for certain if the newcomers stick around and become a group of people we do know. I initially interpreted this story as the newcomers becoming the Templars, but that is actually not implied. Innocence uses the newcomers' fear of fire and their warnings about the cleansing fire to convince people to follow him, Maxarius. The moral foundation of Maxarius' new religion, though, is don't worry about fire or death and doom beyond the mortal ken that the newcomers talk about because our god the lord of light will protect you as long as you're not like the newcomers or my terrible brother sin i believe that maxarius used the newcomers in a similar fashion to how he used sin as a warning of this new god's wrath so where the newcomers ended up is still unknown Accepting that the newcomers might be aliens is tough, because that makes you want to know what planet they're from, how human they are, if they're connected to other aliens, like Harbingers maybe. And if they are aliens, what happens to them after they emerge from the shrine? Do they assimilate? Do they take off in their spaceship? Do they just die and archaeologists haven't discovered their alien bones yet? The question of the newcomers' origins and ends is something that is driving me nuts. Another question the revelation of Maxarius being innocence brings about is that the Mother of Two might not even exist. Previously, the Mother of Two was speculated to be Calandra, primarily because she was a powerful woman with the power to mirror objects who we had not yet met. Sin and Innocence being brothers, possibly twins, led many to believe their mother of two was actually Calandra herself. It was a decent theory until Lake of Calandra League, where Calandra's disdain for gods and her long, long, long eternity spent stuck on the lake itself made that seem impossible. She's been trapped on her lake since before the Earth fully formed, it seems so it's unlikely she escaped her prison long enough to get pregnant, have kids, and raise them. But now, we know that the whole story in which the Mother of Two exists is a fabrication. If that's the case, is her identity even relevant? Surely, Sin and Innocence have a mother, but is she anyone important? I saw an interesting theory that the Mother of Two was actually Viridi. You can check it out in the links in the description below. While I think a lot of their speculation about Viridi herself is interesting and probable in relation to the Winter of the World, I suspect that Sin and Innocence's mother is not a person of note. Considering that Maxarius had absolutely no pull, no sway, no followers, and was so desperate for power and recognition, having a mother that was a god and revered by the Asmiri 
would have certainly given him more favor than he had. And in the Templar propaganda, part of Innocence's ascension and Sin's condemnation is incurred by the mother herself. This never actually happened, so her real identity likely had no sway on their ascension story. And finally, I have questions about the pact that Chaos made with those High Priests of the Vol long ago, which gave them the Blood Crucible they passed down for centuries, eventually ending up with the last to die. Was the original purpose of the Blood Crucible to bring the fight to the Scourge? Or was there some other reason it was gifted? It is a device that allows dimensional travel, at least to the ravaged lands where the Scourge come from. But we can only presume that Last to Die is able to shift between other dimensions with its power. So if we assume that the Blood Crucible's main purpose is the fight with the Scourge, that not only reiterates the question of how long the Scourge has been a threat, but also what stake does Chaos have in this fight? We know that Chaos sees many dimensions and the various outcomes of acts across each dimension. The Trial Master tells us, through the grace of Chaos, I now understand that all things that can happen do. Even now, I am testing the might of another survivor who washed up on Rayclast instead of you, and to her, you are dead. Chaos sees all outcomes and enjoys seeing the different possibilities. Chaos seems to act as a neutral party, more interested in how an individual's abilities might end up weighing the coin toss of chance between dimensions. If that's the case, why would he give the High Priests a tool that would clearly help them in the fight against the Scourge? Maybe it is that all the worlds will end without this tool and Chaos wants to continue observing. Maybe Chaos is in danger if the Scourge succeed. The Trial Master does hint that Chaos may actually be in danger. Chaos has often felt there is a sinister force lurking in the unknown mists of raw creation that seeks to oppose him. It does not show itself. No, it is a cowardly impulse, one that subtly tangles the threads of fate to bring together mortals in each era for the purpose of order, a cold conflict that has raged eternal, with only one exception. But this just does not sound like the Scourge Demons. Bringing mortals together for the purpose of order? What does that mean? And what is the one exception? Once again, I am left completely uncertain. I don't know the connection between Chaos, the Scourge, and this unknown impulse of order. However, that doesn't mean I'm going to leave you only with questions I cannot even theorize on. Because I do have a theory, and it actually expands far beyond the bounds of the Forbidden Sanctum League. I have had a growing sense that the recent leagues, starting with Ultimatum, to be specific, are building up to what I'd call a new core story for Path of Exile, or maybe even Path of Exile 2. Right now, the current core story of Path of Exile is the Purity Rebellion and the Cataclysm. Almost all of the stories we are told, past, present, and ancient, have had these two events as the central point connecting them. The Purity Rebellion introduced various peoples of Rayclast and Oriath, the important historical figures on the sides of Templars or Thaumaturgists, and the architecture and history of the land we are exiled to. The Cataclysm explains the beast, the virtue gems we use, and ties us back to the Vol, the gods, etc. The use of map devices, the views of Purity versus Thaumaturgy, the Shaper and Elder, the Labyrinth, all of these things can be related back to the Purity Rebellion and Cataclysm. What I see brewing is a new core related to Chaos, the Scourge, and Eldritch Beings. There have been so many small connections between these new concepts between Leagues that are almost independent from the previous core that I believe a new foundation for the story of Path of Exile is being set. Not to replace, but to create more opportunities for stories that can explore different parts of the past and allow new paths for the future. So, what the heck am I talking about? Let me try to walk through what has been set up so far, league by league. Ultimatum League set up the entity Chaos, a being who is interested in the fates of mortals and the concept of chance. He is able to view multiple dimensions to see each possibility of each decision that is ever made. 
and he enjoys testing those mortals he finds the most interesting, namely ones who seem able to influence their own fates. We are also introduced through flavor text to the concept of high priests of the Vol, and a god named Yaomak, a three-headed serpent. Expedition League seemed mostly self-contained in its lore, besides some hints that the Kalgar possibly faced the Elder, a being they called the Empty-Eyed Fiend, and that some Kalgar had potentially survived on Rayclass after their unsuccessful colonization attempt following the fall of the Vol. But one seemingly throwaway story about a particular city the Kalgar visited, Utsal, is what connects to this new core. The city of Utsal had mountains of gold, with nobles and priests lurking near the treasures unwilling to give them up, locking themselves in their own tombs to protect the treasure. The nobles had purposely drowned themselves to spite would-be looters, and had done so successfully, as the Kalgar had to move on for they could not drain the deadly waters. In Scourge, we're introduced to the concept of Scourge Demons, which are replacing or assimilating the previous Beyond Demons. These are part of the interdimensional threat that High Templar Venarius had feared, which is lore that had already been established. But Last to Die mentions that her ancestors, High Priests of the Vol, had made a pact with Chaos to receive the Blood Crucible used to fight the Scourge. We also learn that a dimension in which High Templar Venarius is still alive is the only dimension Last to Die has visited that has fought and survived a full assault of the Scourge. This gives question to the means which Venarius used to fight off the Scourge, and the reasons why Last to Die would entrust us personally with the Blood Crucible. It makes me suspect that the real way to fight the Scourge has something to do with Eldritch powers. Venarius may have used the Elder, and we have the Maven. Then we get Siege of the Atlas, where more Eldritch entities have decided to come visit Rayclast, and we do a classic protagonist teams up with antagonists to fight their common villain and help the Maven as her mortal champion to fend off these new entities. These entities are the Tangle and the Cleansing Fire. We don't know if the Tangle has visited our world before, Although similarities between the imagery of Sin's flesh assimilation in the False Templar origin story of Sin and Innocence is a possible hint the Tangle has visited. If Crystallized Omniscience was about Rayclast, maybe the flavor text of items like Ceaseless Feast are also. But it is in this league we learn that the Cleansing Fire has been to Rayclast, even if we do not yet understand what we are being told. Sentinel didn't really have lore, and Lake of Calandra's lore's only purpose for this theory is that it sowed doubt that Calandra could be the mother of two. But Calandra League actually gave us a bigger piece of information hidden on the unique map that leads to the Trial Master fight, the Tower of Ordeals. It reads, On the outskirts of Utsal, at the Temple of Chaos, the Trial Master awaits your challenge. Now we can connect Utsal, the city the Kalgar had visited, the only Vol city given a name in the Kalgar lore, to the worship of Chaos. And thus we can tie the High Priests, the ancestors of the last to die, to the city of Utsal, and say that's where the pact was made and the Blood Crucible was given. And now, in Forbidden Sanctum, we learn that the Templars and Innocence himself are based off of symbols and threats inspired by the previous visit of the Cleansing Fire to Rayclast. We learn that more Templars than Venarius are aware of the Scourge. More Templars than Lycia know that Innocence's origin story is propaganda, and they possibly know about the Cleansing Fire's visit to Rayclast. We see that Divinia has read a note left by the last to die, and based on how cagey Divinia is with her knowledge, she may have even met the last to die in person, which means Divinia and other Templars may know that Chaos has put things in motion to fight the Scourge, namely the Blood Crucible. And the last to die may know that Eldritch powers are what's really necessary to fight the Scourge from her shifts to different Rayclasts. And it seems that Chaos is invested in preventing the Scourge, perhaps for his own preservation, 
or for preserving life across every dimension. We also find out that Kadiro, the uncle of Chittis Parandis and loot hoarding ghost man, has made deals with Chaos in the past, meaning that Chaos is one of a few entities, he's never called a god, that stayed alive during the time of the beast. Chaos, Prospero, and Hinakora. The latter two are gods of their own underworlds, and Chaos might be eldritch or cosmic. So the common factor for them staying active during the Beast seems to be not being on the surface of Rayclast. Regardless, they are also among the gods or entities we do not slay when the other gods awaken. They are the remaining players that are not explicitly eldritch beings. Chaos, Utsal, Scourge, Innocence, the Cleansing Fire. Some new tapestry of lore is being woven here. So many things are threatening existence on Rayclast. Demons from beyond, entities from the cosmos, and birds on a lake. Okay, not the last one, but I see the beginnings of a new lore foundation here. The Pact with Chaos, the knowledge of the Vol and the doings of their high priests. Innocents running to the south of the world before we learn about his true origins the multiple ways the Scourge are trying to break into our world, at the same time as eldritch beings coming to fight us and also to defend us in the case of the Maven. Where can we go from saving the world from eldritch beings? What does this have to do with the Vol and Chaos? There must be some future event, likely the Scourge threat becoming imminent, that we will be involved in. I believe that future leagues will give us the pieces of knowledge, tools, and introduce people we will need to thwart the Scourge for good. We may need to know more about the High Priest of the Vol in the city of Utsal in regards to Chaos, the Blood Crucible, or even the new god we hear about briefly, Yaomak. Maybe Innocence will have to face his shame over the destruction of Oriath in light of the Cleansing Fire's return. If Eldritch powers are key to defeating the Scourge, that may be the Maven's payment for our help protecting her. We have heard the Envoy talking about order before in regards to two forces at play in the cosmos, the Progenitor and the Lightkeeper. If Chaos is opposed to order, maybe that order is the Lightkeeper, and we are once again stuck between two Eldritch opponents. What could the Scourge have to do with order or chaos? Could order be what allows the headless scourge to think, or the mind that thinks for them? What about other interdimensional threats like breach monsters? Some of the loose ends of old threads could be weaved into this new tapestry. There are so many possibilities for this new core of lore. It can introduce new gods, new groups of people, even aliens if that's really where the newcomers come from. I see a lot of potential here, and even if it's not a new core, and this storyline will be wrapped up in a bow and finished soon, it's the longest string of interconnected stories we've seen in a while. No matter where this goes, Forbidden Sanctum has made this lore nerd very happy. Thank you so much for watching, it's your Beyond Demon Noodle. Sorry for the delay in this video. I had a funeral and spent a week with family on top of work just being crazy. I usually like to get to Endgame myself and film everything, but I just wasn't able to do that. So big ups to Arcanin who helped me get footage. And thanks to the patrons, subscribers, and Baydat for keeping this channel alive. For the price of immortality, all I ask is that you stay sane, Exile.